So I just want to welcome everybody. Uh, I'm the MC for this event. My name is Michael Twyman. Um, a, a little bit about me soon, um, but I just want to let everybody know we're going to try to do our best to keep the event to 45 minutes um, or so, so that we know everybody's busy. And um, and I want to start by introducing Anat Enbar. She is the executive director of Canadian Friends of Sheba, and I'm going to let her say a few words before we begin. Thank you, Michael, and uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Uh, Talia Golan from Israel. Uh, good morning, North America. We we have the the pleasure to have uh, Canadian Friends of Sheba participating this morning, as well our uh, friends of south of the border. Uh, American Friends of Sheba, and thank you um, to my colleague, Brian Abrams, uh, who is the CEO of um, American Friends of Sheba. Um, just a few words. Uh, it's been 10 days ago, I believe, that we've, uh, me and my colleagues visited uh, Sheba in Israel. And part of the visit was uh, taking uh, a tour at the, Cancer Center at Chiba, which soon will become the oncology hospital of uh, Chiba. And uh, it was really fascinating to see the labs, the, the wards, the, the treatment, the research that is uh, going uh, there, and all the cutting edge um, technology that has been uh, used in, uh, in Chiba. And it's hard to have a webinar this morning without saying uh, that our heart to the uh, war in uh, Europe, uh, Ukraine. And uh, the reason I'm saying it is because Sheba is sending um, a team with an Israeli humanitarian mission to Ukraine. And it will be the first time that Sheba will send the telehealth um, team from Sheba Beyond uh, to make, uh, as we always say, tikkun olam, and hopefully the, the global impact of Sheba will be out there as well. And I think we will start with a short video about Sheba and then back to you, Michael. And thank you so much, Michael, for taking this uh, initiative. During the past few years, healthcare systems are experiencing a global crisis due to an expanding gap caused by the growing number of patients, which is compounded by a shortage of beds and medical staff. Each day, we are witnessing new, advanced, game-changing healthcare technologies. A transformation in health technologies has been taking place around the world. In reality, the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated this rapid technological progress. We. At Chiba Medical Center, one of the world's largest hospitals, ranked at the top 10 best hospitals in the world, believe we have another role. Our role is to lead this transformation. We call it the City of Health, an ecosystem of cutting edge healthcare, science, technology, and improved quality of life, located in the heart of Israel. The City of Health highlights a wide ranging, groundbreaking journey into the future of medicine. We are redesigning healthcare and preparing it for the challenges of 2030 and beyond. A multidisciplinary cancer center, cutting edge children's hospital, advanced cardiovascular and stroke center, innovative neonatal intensive care unit, and more. But the city of health is much more than buildings and wards. It's a story about people. It's a story of breaking the boundaries of patient care. And it's not just about illness, but much more comprehensive about diagnosis, prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation. The City of Health represents a paradigm shift in the patient's experience. Smart patient care rooms, alternative approaches to pediatric treatment, new therapies for oncology, and more. The City of Health is also a leap in time and space. We will have the ability to connect with patients anytime, anywhere, through a digital transformation, rapid check-in, and Chiba Beyond, our virtual hospital. We are also building the Biotech Valley, 
This will be a unique living space covering an area of 200,000 square meters that will feature hundreds of startups, biotech companies, educational institutions, and pharma industry. There will be light rail transport and autonomous vehicles, as well as pioneering industrial areas. The Biotech Valley will be anchored by a high-tech ecosystem, ARC, Shiba's Global Innovation Program, a large advanced research institute, MSR, our new and state-of-the-art center for medical simulation, and companies working in the fields of biotech, digital healthcare, genetics, bioconvergence, and more. The Biotech Valley will offer our partners the ability to easily conduct experiments and research, to access data, and to connect to a leading international innovation network. For the first time, they will enjoy the proximity of a complete biotechnology cluster in the center of Israel with highly qualified professionals who are leading medical innovation in Israel and the world. Today, we are proud to realize that our vision of the city of health becomes a reality. Together, we can and will change the future of healthcare. Sheba Tel HaShomer, the city of health. That uh, is very impressive, uh, all of the stuff that she was doing. And we saw Dr. Golan uh, on the video as well, and we'll be talking to her. So I just wanted to introduce myself quickly. My name is Michael Twyman. I'm the founder of the Maryland Initiative, which is a charitable organization that was created uh, in memory of my mother who, who passed away. And the first initiative of the Maryland Initiative is the Helping Hand Tote Bag, which is uh, a versatile tote bag where 100% of the profits of the tote bag will be donated to Dr. Golan's lab um, at Sheba. Um, so that, that's why I'm here today asking Dr. Golan questions. That's my connection. I'm honored to be speaking with Dr. Golan today. And we are just going to put up for a brief plug the QR code. There's a QR code we're going to put up that allows uh, the purchase of the bag. We will be putting it up again at the end of the uh, talk. And um, if you scan your screen, you'll be taken to the purchase site. And if you use the code SHEBA22, S-H-E-B-A 22, you will get the $25 discount off the bag, which was the registration fee for the program. So we're gonna leave that up for one second uh, if to scan it, and then we will move on to introducing our featured guest today, Dr. Golan. So Dr. Golan, uh, I'm gonna just gonna briefly introduce our featured speaker, uh, Dr. and we're gonna have so sort of a fireside chat with Dr. Golan where I will be asking Dr. Golan questions and there will be a chance for audience questions at the end through the Q&A box. Um, we will try to make room if people have questions for Dr. Golan to answer as well. And so Dr. Golan um, is the phase, the head of the phase one program of the Pancreatic Cancer Center at Sheba Hospital. Um, she uh, has been involved with a number of clinical trials involving uh, drugs related to treating BRCA mutations, which is part of the focus of the talk today. And my connection, I'm uh, myself BRCA, have a BRCA1 mutation. Um, so this, her research is very meaningful to me. And um, she, she does clinical work and research work. And uh, again, very honored to speak to her today. Good morning. And in Israel, good evening, Dr. Golan. So thank you. It's an absolute uh, pleasure being here. Um, Michael, you really warmed my heart. You know, I don't know if you can... Uh, I don't know if you want to tell the background story to how this all happened, but it was, I think it's just colleagues being collegial to each other. Um, you had questions, you and your family had questions um, to me on your late mom. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, I think, it was just very natural for me to try and help, even though, you know, obviously I, I wasn't there and I didn't see her personally, but at least, you know, we could, think some things through and maybe I could try and give my perspective on, on the disease and from an understanding that I've learned and, and gained um, in the BRCA world and, and solid tumors, uh, which includes 
gastric cancer and pancreatic cancer and then ovarian cancer and breast cancer and prostate cancer. Those are the, more, the most common for, for the BRCA mutations. And um, I have to start and say I was so taken by this initiative because it was really, I think, one colleague to another just giving what I think colleagues should do for each other if it's in the same country or abroad. And um, I didn't have any inclination that this would come around in this way. And it's one of those uh, moments when you just realize that giving is receiving. Right. And it's, it's a very, one of those like meaningful moments and it's really beautiful. So thank you very much. You your family personally, and it's, it's really, it's just each time that these kind of things happen, I'm so surprised because it's, you give to give, you never give because you think you're going to receive back. That's how it should be. It's not like a, a shekel for a shekel or Canadian dollar for a Canadian dollar, but for somehow sure. like giving is just receiving. It's really beautiful. So thank you. I'd like to start and thank you. Yes. And, you know, what I sort of said um, to myself was that, you know, through the very difficult time we had and your generosity and sort of guiding, um, you know, possible treatments and making sort of making sure that we were doing the best thing possible. But I did want to make sure that, you know, from the bad experience, that very horrible experience that we had with our, with this illness, that some good would come of it. And, and that the Maryland Initiative um, is really about that and um, trying to make some good come of it and maybe to help other people along the way. So I hope I hope this is the first of many uh, initiatives to help people. And uh, again, thank you. I'm, I'm great. I'm glad we could do this and that um, we can also give some information. Um, so let me move into some some of the questions. And um, so just quickly about you, um, what just briefly the various hats you roll, uh, the various hats that you wear uh, in your roles as as a doctor, can you just briefly tell everybody sort of um, what what your functions are um, in, in Sheba and in general? Yeah, so I uh, finished specializing in 2009 and then already as a as a medical student and as when I was specializing, I was always intrigued by research and um, I, I was just curious. I really wanted to be part of a strong research team um, doing something beyond. Um, I've always loved my patient care. It was obvious to me that I would never only do research, that I need to have my hand on at least 20 to 40 to 50 patients a week. Um, it was just where my where I felt I could give my kind of um, um, giving and, and be the kind of physician that I really wanted to be. Um, and around, when I was already specializing, I was really intrigued about the BRCA mutation. It's also something that we have in some of our family members and I knew it was enriched in the Jewish population and other founder mutations. And I was like really intrigued about that whole hereditary issue. So already as when I was specializing, I kind of um, tried to meet with people who already, you know, um, actually in, in kind of had kind of they built the, 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 the starting blocks for me. They were already known in the field. People like Eitan Friedman, who's well known, and Bella Kaufman who passed away, who was really part of those worlds as well. And that was a great introduction for me as a young physician. Um, another thing that I felt was that drug development was for me, part of the way forward. So that I felt that if I was being exposed to new drugs in development and I can facilitate the, the improvement of those drugs for my patients, maybe I could make a difference or maybe I could be part of a team that was making a difference. So when I finished my speciality in 2009, um, I was honored to be given the role to head the phase one program, which means the early drug development program at Sheba Medical Center. And I was already then really hooked on hereditary syndromes. And, you know, and I started like looking for those patients, particularly in the GI tumors, which means the gastrointestinal tumors. Um, and around that time, about 2010, 11, I realized that I would need model systems. Like I was seeing some really spectacular, phenomenal things in the clinic with my patients. Some of the patients were living for a long time and some of them were passing away. And I really wanted to try and see how I could capture that moment. So that moment in the clinic, I wanted to capture it in some kind of model system in the lab so that I could carry on 
going back and really analyzing these really unique clinical perspectives and findings that I was seeing in the clinic. So that's when I, in 2011, I opened my own research lab. Um, and what I've tried to do, as I say, is capture the moments, capture the clinical moments. Mm. So when I kind of put it together, you ask me what do I do. So I do early phase drug development. I see a lot of patients. I see about 40 to 60 patients a week. Um, and I have an active research lab that what we're doing there is we have these model systems that's from biopsies taken from patients that we put into a host that we can have the cells growing. And then we could look back and see, you know, which are the, which are the patients who are responding, who are not responding, why, and then really analyze that. That's, that's very fascinating. Um, and that's, you're really trying to attack it at the, in the, sort of see how it all grows, which is uh, amazing. And just in layman's terms, we're trying to make uh, this interview both for people who know a lot about BRCA and for people who don't. But in layman's terms, briefly, uh, what is a BRCA mutation and why does it increase the risk of cancer? Okay, so approximately, and it's a rough number, but about 10% of patients who have tumors, they have an hereditary component to that tumor. What does it mean? It means that the one of the driving mutations, which means one of the dominant mutations that's driving the, um, the initiation of the tumor and also the, the, the proliferation that's, that the cells growing is an hereditary component. In the hereditary, in the hereditary syndromes, one of the most common hereditary syndrome is a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. So interestingly, these genes are very, very important in, um, in repairing cell cells and the cells in the cell cycle. So what happens is all the time in our bodies, cells go through damage and they need to be um, repaired. They go through damage and they need to be repaired. And this is one of the major repair proteins, this gene gives you a BRCA1 or 2 protein, which is one of the major proteins in the repair mechanisms of cells. And if you have a mutation, what is happening is you're having a problem in doing your repair. So it actually is like an Achilles tendon. And because you're having a problem in doing the repair, the cell goes for an other mechanisms of repair that are more error prone. So you kind of have the more, you have more of an ability to develop the cancer because your, your body, if you have a BRCA mutation, has, is going to rely on these more error-prone repair systems in the BRCA system, which is a very good system. So that's what causes the cancer. We don't know why, but it is enriched with certain cancers, as I said earlier, like pancreatic cancer, uh, cholangial carcinoma, um, uh, gastric cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, and breast cancer. So we don't know why it doesn't do other tumors more and why it's these tumors. Those are one of the still ongoing investigations. Um, but we know that it does higher enrichment of these cancers in these families. And what's also interesting is that you may be an affected family member, which means you may carry the gene and you may never develop cancer. And you may have, you know, you may have the gene and develop cancer. So there's also environmental aspects that are going to determine how much this gene is penetrating um, in that generation. So that's another thing as well. Excellent. Um, excellent information. Um, so what would you say are the biggest strides we've made, we as you know, the scientific community um, have made in treating BRCA mutated cancers? And what are some of the drawbacks of those? And then I'm going to also ask you about how that plays into your work. So interestingly, um, once you understand the mechanisms of why the tumor is caused, which is you know, relying on these more error-prone uh, pathways, we also know that there's an elevation of a protein that's called PARP. So we know that once you have your BRCA gene defective, you're gonna have higher PARP levels. So um, through drug development, they have developed a drug that actually inhibits, which means it stops the, um, the, the activity of that enzyme, that PARP enzyme. And then the cell now, the cancer cell, which has been relying on that pathway to do all its, its work, kind of collapses. 
it's like suddenly it's, it's like it's using the knowledge taking that knowledge and seeing what does that BRCA gene cause? Oh, it causes a much higher elevation of this enzyme. Let's hit that enzyme with like a missile. This is what it is. This is what this drug does. It's called PARP inhibitors and it actually hits that enzyme like a missile. So if you, are, if you have a BRCA mutation, the effect is gonna be severe. It can cause almost all the cancer cells sometimes to die. But if you don't have, then it's not really going to affect the tumor. Mm. So this is a beautiful illustration of what we call precision medicine. So the knowledge that comes with understanding the biology and what that biology um, causes facilitates drug development and precision medicine. And it will only work in that setting. It's not gonna work in a patient with a tumor without the BRCA mutation. So it's selective and that's why it's called precision medicine. So um, for, my, for everybody's understanding, um, is it that when you hit the PARP with this missile, the cancer cell has no way to sort of replicate and repair itself because BRCA is now mutated, PARP is now blocked, and the cancer cell can't proliferate. Is that the, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It's like you you've learned it's secret. It's secret. It's secret is it's using that other. It's it's using in a much exaggerated manner that other pathway, that PAR pathway, and that knowledge causes the, the term is called synthetic lethal lethality. So you, I think every even though it's a medical term, I think everybody can understand that that synthesis that comes with that knowledge causes this lethality, this death of the cells. So why, so back, back to the question about drawbacks. So if, if this seems like such a, uh, such a, a very good method where the cancer cell just can't replicate anymore, what uh, my understanding is that eventually there is resistance to these PARP inhibitors. What uh, causes that and what are ways to get now beyond the next step ahead of cancer? Okay, so I'll give you like an, I'll give you all kind of a very basic understanding of what happens. So cancer cells have, they're not homogeneous. Okay, you have different populations, even though you have like in breast tumor, it's all a certain type of cancer. It's not, a, not all the cells are homogeneous. It means that some of the cell populations have slight alterations. Then these alterations can give them or make them more sensitive to the treatment or make them more resistant to the treatment. So over the course of time, you're gonna knock all the cells that are very, very sensitive. And you may even have like a 1% of cells that are resistant, but over the course of time, they may become more and more, uh, they may proliferate and they, may be, they can become the dominant cell. That's one of, that's one of the reasons how a resistance can emerge from a cancer. And another thing is that cancer cells can be very, very, um, they can be very savvy. I don't know if that's the right word, but they can, um, they can learn mechanisms to resist. So they can learn how to push a drug out of a cell. They can find circumvent ways to um, to, to develop, and they can sometimes actually even take that mutation and reverse that mutation so that when you look at the tumor, and this is what we've been able to do in our model system. So we, as I say, we take a biopsy from a patient and we put it, we actually use mostly mouse models um, because, and I'm, I'm sorry for people that, you know, I'm an, I'm an animal lover and, you know, but this is the only way that we can actually advance science and we need the cells in a host that they can develop, that we have cells alive and propagating. And looking at those cells, we've, sh we've shown that some of them actually have changed the mutation back to an active mutation. So yeah. it's really phenomenal that the cancer cells can be so, so clever um, you know, and, and that's one of the mechanisms of resistance. And what's really interesting is that timing seems of the most importance because at an early stage of a disease, there's much less resistant cells out there. Mm. So you have a much more homogeneous population, but very far in the disease, you have more and more of these subpopulations of cells that can be, you know, that can find re resistant mechanisms. Mm. Uh, that's fascinating and, and suggests, I guess, that the importance of what the early treatment is um, 
when when people are diagnosed. So um, on a more positive note, what what trials have you been involved with where you've seen really good results? I mean, again, eventually there's resistance, but where you've almost been, can you tell us sort of some success stories where you've been surprised to see very hard to treat cancers and people having um, very outstanding results? Um, so there was a study called Study 42, which was um, initiated by Bella Kaufman, who passed away actually from breast cancer um, last year, and it was a huge loss to our community, the BRCA community. She was one of the building blocks to this, um, to this disease, and she did a really interesting study. It's called like a basket study, so trying to take all the different tumors with BRCA mutation. So we don't care if you've got gastric cancer or prostate cancer. As long as you've got an hereditary component of BRCA1 or 2 and you've got a cancer, you were allowed to go into the trial. And what we actually, and, and these patients received a PARP inhibitor, which blocks the PARP. This is specific for the BRCA, the drug that we discussed earlier. And um, one of my last patients um, that I put on the trial, because the trial closed, it was, I think it was in 2011 when the trial closed. Um, he was a young 49 year old lawyer, very, very, um, I don't know, very sophisticated, that's the word. Um, and he, uh, he was just on chemotherapy and he had new liver metastases. And he was, his father had actually died at the age of 51 from lung cancer in his arms, his father. So he was, um, he was very skeptical about cancer and about you know, um, drugs and, and chemotherapy. And he was like, I don't want any chemotherapy. I said, well, you know, there's this trial that's just opened. You know, you would be one of the last patients to go in because the trial's closing, but there's other chemotherapy options that I'd like to give. And he's like, no, I don't want any more chemotherapy options. I said, well, you know, try come onto this trial. And, um, and he came onto the trial and he had a complete response, which means that the tumor in his liver and his pancreas disappeared. And uh, we 11 years down the lane. So he was our kind of our poster patient. Um, and it's been a phenomenal journey, like to see, I mean, as a young physician, it was like actually seeing a miracle. I mean, I knew that the drug helped because I'd seen patients earlier. I'd seen how their tumors had gone away, but then how they'd come back. He was the first patient that I'd seen with such a devastating disease, pancreatic cancer, that had actually been cured with advanced disease. And even now when I speak about it, I remember I'm a very optimistic person. I think that's why I can be in this field because I'm a believer and I always think that, I always believe that each patient's gonna give like a good response. But that was like, even for me, beyond what I envisioned. I could not believe that a patient would actually be cured for years, you know, by this drug. And this patient is still alive today, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. He's that, actually got another cancer. He's got another cancer, which is, um, he's actually got a kidney cancer. He's been treated by immunotherapy and that now is under control, but his pancreatic cancer never came back. And he's uh, two small children and, um, and they actually had their bat mitzvot and they were, I think, going into grade one or two. Um, and I remember that. So that's been, for me, a phenomenal journey. And then since then, um, we did a, a big global study um, that actually in pancreatic cancer with this drug, um, I was one of the co-leaders of the trial and it led to um, FDA approval of the drug. And since then we've had other patients. So this is like also really interesting in cancer, like when you see one phenomena, when you see it happening once, but you've actually got plausible biological um, evidence to explain what you're seeing, you're going to see it again. And that's actually what's happened. I've had, you know, more and more patients going into long-term remission from the drug. And even those, and then there's a smaller group of patients that just, you know, have a very good quality of life. Um, they're not cured, but they have, a, you know, a much better quality of life. So this was for me, one of my most, um, eventful and meaningful, um, you know, uh, drugs that I was, you know, involved in um, that led to the FDA approval. And I've often said, I, I don't know what would have happened if the trial was a negative trial. Uh, you know, I kept on saying that I think I may have like just left, 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 you know, I don't know, <laughs> left the scene, like gone into, I don't know what, something else. I love doing sport. Maybe I would go and do sports or something like that, but I probably would have stayed and just persevered. Right. But it really gave me like a lot, a lot of wind into my sails. So that's, I think, a good segue to 
talk about specifically more of the work you're doing. So can you just tell everybody a little bit about the, the lab at Sheba, how many people work there, where your funding comes from, and again, sort of a layman's overview of some of the exciting things you're working on um, at the lab. So um, the, let's start with the, in my lab, we have eight personnel. Um, so we have like uh, MD, PhDs, we have um, PhDs, we've got postdocs, and we have lab technicians. Um, and the focus, first of all, the funding, um, we write at least 10 grants a year. I don't know if you know, but competitive grants is about a, 50, a 10 to 25 percent chance of getting competitive grants. So you're always writing grants. And then once it's out, you even forget about it till you get your rejection, or if you're lucky, you get your approval. It's a very competitive academic world, but it's very good because it keeps you all the time on your toes because you've got to write, you have to have very clear research ideas. You have to formulate them. You have to formulate a whole method methodology to get to them. You have to show preliminary data. So this is like really important and been participating in writing grants from since I opened my lab. Um, luckily, I'm getting a little bit more grants now as you know, we've got higher publications and better publications. Um, and then there's another aspect that we use, we do philanthropic work. Um, I think that this is, I've got a colleagues abroad uh, in Canada, in America, you know, this is the way it's done. You, you, you have to do your competitive grants because it's your academic also signature, but you also have, you know, you, it's not enough. Like there's some projects, for example, in early prevention that are really difficult to get grants in because they could be, it could be a project for eight or 10 years, you know, so that would be like harder to get. The focus of our lab is advanced pancreatic cancer, BRCA mutations, we've got enrichment with the BRCA mutations, we've really got to understand these patients, we've tried to get a lot of model systems that capture these patients, the ones that are responding, the ones that have gone into a complete remission, and the ones that have developed resistance, and now we've got quite a lot of models um, capture, capturing, mirroring these exact clinical scenarios and, and we're investigating to understand if you could maybe add another drug to the PARP inhibitor or when you must bring the PARP in and when you must do chemo. So we really, because you can go back and you can do 40 experiments in, in, you know, in mice that you can't do that in humans, of course. Um, we share, we, we share with a lot of people. Um, we share with lots of uh, community, academic communities in the United States, in Canada, in Europe. We share our, our model systems because we've got unique ones that other people haven't managed to develop. And um, there's no there's no one owns any knowledge. Knowledge has to be shared. And we've been, you know, um, we've been very, very persistent in developing a lot of systems and model systems. And this now has been kind of published and people know about it. So people reach out to us. And then um, obviously we have to see that what they're doing has, um, clinical and academic um, credibility because, you know, we are protecting the model systems from our patients who helped us to develop, men, to develop them. And, you know, that's important. I want to speak a little bit about that specific point. Um, I used to feel really bad coming to the patients and saying and asking them if I can do an extra biopsy and how do they feel about it and trying to explain to them what we're doing in the lab and why it's so important. And, one of the things that my patients has taught me that it's not me asking them. We are actually all exactly on the same side of the table. And there's like, there's, there's nothing between us. So it's not like I, I'm facilitating for them the opportunity to improve science and to help them with the hereditary component. And, and it really took me a while to get my mind around that. And I'm grateful there's been quite a few patients that illustrated and explained to me why, you know, I don't have to feel bad asking them. This is for both of us. Like we both invested in this in the same way. And, and now I, I'm, I, you know, I come to patients and I say, you know, this is, I don't know if this is going to help you. I can't promise you that, but I know that this is going to help science. If not through me, then through my collaborators and et cetera. And then last, just one last thing is that prevention. So this is an hereditary disease. Um, and early on, I've had um, programs that have um, that have also focused 
on prevention because I think maybe seeing like the end result and how devastating it is, it made me like really also like focus on that early stage of development. And we've got quite a few really nice projects and we're part of also consortium worldwide in this. And that is a really important part, especially in hereditary syndromes. Amazing, that's amazing work. Um, and, you know, it's, I, I hope, as I'm sure you do, that, you know, all the things you learn from these models will generate better um, outcomes and, and hope for the future. And on that specific note, um, so I wanted to ask you kind of more abstractly, I guess, but uh, I, I'm always interested in hearing from people because, um, you know, sort of when I was going through this uh, with my mother, I, I, I sort of thought to myself, from a big picture perspective, isn't it amazing that with all the technology that we have, that we can sort of analyze the genome, we can see things at a microscopic level, we have all the money to, to try to treat cancer, that yet cancer still succeeds in, in many cases. We've made strides, but certainly it hasn't been eliminated. What, what are your, where do you see things in 10 to 20 years? What's the next big thing in cancer treatment generally? And do you have hope that sort of BRCA mutations and, and their effects will be something that's more of a chronic disease or something that's treatable or preventable in the future, specifically, uh, like, will, will we conquer BRCA specifically? I would say definitely yes. I don't know if I can say in 10 years time, I wouldn't give a timeline. I wouldn't be, I don't think I can give a timeline, but I'll tell you why I, I say it with such certainty. In biology, once you understand the mechanism and you start understanding the mechanisms of resistance and you start understanding what's happening, and I'm talking about a community, not like Tali and only her lab, I'm saying it's a community that is devoted to the BRCA gene um, and we're sharing knowledge and we, we you know, how, how do you share knowledge or you've got collaborations or you publish. You, every time you, you learn something, you quickly publish it and that, and that's how you share your knowledge. And we've learned this from other diseases. When you don't know, when it's like, it's, it's, that's like it in any, think even in maths. Like if you've got a very difficult equation, but you start like seeing, like that you start working it through, you know, you're going to get to the end. It may take you three hours. It may take you half an hour, but you know, you're going to get there because you're on a path. And that path is showing you that you are being exact in your thoughts and how you're doing it. And that's what I feel with the BRCA. It's been um, 1992, the gene was first described. Um, PARP inhibitors were developed in like 2000s and plus. And um, it's, I think that we've seen this in other diseases as well. Once you understand the biology, it's just a matter of time till you conquer that. We haven't conquered it yet, but we're on the way. I don't know, Mike, if I would say 10 years, because it may be a year and it may be 15. But it does matter and it doesn't matter. It matters that we're going to do it. And I would love to be a part of that. But if it happens before my time or after, I would be grateful well, for it anyway. For sure. And what about <laughs> just maybe you, you, I know you spend a lot of your focus on BRCA generally, but what about just cancer, you know, cancer treatments in general, like immunotherapy? Do you think immunotherapy ultimately holds the, uh, the, the cards for treating cancer as a whole. I know cancer is a, some people talk about cancer as not a uniform disease, so it's hard to speak of it like that. But do you see any other kind of unexpected type of treatment coming down the pipeline? Um, because there was a time when people thought immunotherapy was sort of, you can't use your immune system to fight cancer, that that's not something that would work and people didn't believe in it. And now it's the focus of many drug companies. So what are your thoughts just generally on, uh, on future treatments? So I think that, and that's how I look at my patients as well. Um, I think that there's a very comprehensive um, and, and, and formidable, and um, there's a comprehensive picture that's coming together in every patient. And that's what makes every patient unique. Like some, some patients, you can really empower them to help. Them. They may not be cured, but they may live for much longer than they, than they would. So that goes a little bit back to the immunotherapy. I think that the immunotherapy has shown us that we can use our bodies, sometimes mechanistically, sometimes 
we need to activate a certain pathway. Sometimes we have to block another part, some other pathway, but we can actually use our own bodies to help us in the healing process. Maybe not to be cured, but in the healing process. And for me, that's like a very strong philosophical message, like where the immunotherapy has led us in the last decade. And um, sometimes like I have patients that come into the room and they are so empowered by their personalities and their, and their decisions. And I just know that we're going to have a good journey together. I'm not saying we're going to be cured, but I know that we're going to beat the statistics. And often that's what happens. So I think that also trying to learn like how people can actually be part of the healing process, which we've done in immunotherapy may also lead to other, to other, other drugs and other options and just seeing, seeing us more comprehensively than, you know, just hitting the patient with chemotherapy. Right. And so just because of time considerations, I'm, I'm probably going to ask you one more question, which is another segue from the chemotherapy question. And then we're going to open up to uh, people asking questions um, that from, from the attendees. And, uh, you know, feel free to ask uh, Dr. Golan a range of things beyond what we've just discussed today, um, obviously related to, you know, cancer and medical treatment, but it doesn't have to be exactly what we've spoken on today, uh, spoken about today. So my last question um, that I'm going to uh, end with is you mentioned chemotherapy and um, there was also, you mentioned, you referenced earlier that quality of life um, when treating people with PARP inhibitors, I think there's probably some improvement on quality of life. Um, what, what is your feeling about whether chemotherapy will be, be used sort of again as a future question um, and, and the balance between the impact of how a patient's quality of life, when, you, when you're deciding whether to treat a patient, how to treat a patient, where does quality of life enter into it? And, and do, you, do you think that one day, um, maybe sooner than 20, 30, 50 years that we will be able to move away from such a harsh treatment like chemotherapy, which has such an effect on a patient's quality of life? So I think that today, even with the immunotherapies and even with the targeted therapies, chemotherapy still stays a back, backbone um, as a treatment for our patients. I think that we all becoming the physicians, the nurses, the psychologists, the patients and their family, much more aware of quality of life. Like we may not, we may want to live four months with a good quality of life, then seven months with a poor quality of life. So these are very like, philosophical conversations that are coming into our day to day. Um, and it, it makes it actually, it makes patient care more complicated because it's much easier to say, this is what I suggest you do than have that conversation, right? But like people are so much more enlightened with social media and with, you know, knowledge being available to everyone and making their own decisions. And I always say to a patient, well, I try to always say, never could say always, I always say to your patients, whatever decision is good for you, this is what I think, these are the options, what you decide, I will support you with. And tomorrow you can change your mind. Um, so I think that that's becoming, I mean, I, that's, the, that's the, 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 the generation that I've been involved in. So I grew up in this kind of, you know, I, did, I don't know the old school kind of, you know, putting your foot down and this is what we're giving you and that's it. This was the generation of physicians that I've been, that I evolved from. So I suppose that's why, you know, that's how I think. Yes. And, and I think that that is a, uh, a move in the right direction where, because people are more educated and especially with some of these advanced cancers, there, there is no, you know, right answer uh, all the time. No, a lot of times doctors don't know. It's not just like you have X disease, we can give you this, it will go away and you'd be crazy not to take it. It's very complicated. So I think um, empowering patients to have the knowledge to make decisions about with risks and benefits is certainly um, is certainly the way to go. And, and the fantastic uh, doctors in Toronto as well that, that treated my mother certainly had that approach. And um, it was 
it was important to see that it wasn't just, you know, we're telling you what to do. So that's an, a very interesting. I think people still think of doctors as like just a paternalistic system where we're just telling you what to do. And, and when things get more complicated, it's certainly important to, uh, to, to make people educated and give them their options. So um, thank you very much. That, that, it's fantastic. Now, and again, we, we so we're going to take some questions now. We don't want to take too, too much of everybody's time, but um, of course, if there are more questions, you can um, forward them after to a nut or to me, and and we can try to give you more information. Um, so, so, just Michael, yes. uh, there, are, there is a list of questions already in the Q and A, yes. and also on the chat that we have uh, between the hosts. Oh, so, okay. so maybe I don't know, uh, Dr. Golan, do you see the QA section? Yeah, I'm asking, um, I'm answering some of the questions for everyone because they're quite short. So, um, how would you like okay. me to do it? Do you want me to so, read the question and ask? Well, answer? let's uh, let's just uh, let's pick one or two that aren't, uh, you know, if they're sort of short, quick answers, then that's fine to just do in writing. Um, but so. Like for example, I this this is like a general knowledge question. I think it's it's Rosa. Um, is pancreatic cancer more relevant in BRCA two carriers than BRCA one? So that that's a that I think is a good question to to pose to you to um, get your input on. Yeah, so it's interesting, Rosa. Um, what we've seen is that certain uh, the mutation can make different tumors. For example, um, uh, BRCA one is more prevalent in ovarian cancer and in um, breast cancer. And uh, BRCA2 is more prominent in, a, in prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer. So to your answer, yes. I'm also and, trying to write an answer as we speak so that, you know, we can... And, uh, and do, and we don't, but we don't know why that is. Is that right, Dr. Golan? We don't know why no, we one haven't, mutation... No, we haven't managed to work out why a certain gene will have a higher prevalence. We just know that in breast and ovary, BRCA1 is more prevalent, and in prostate and uh, pancreatic cancer, BRCA2 gene is more prevalent. Um, the, I like the question, um, I can't see the person's name, but over the next few years, your how large will your department grow um, and in order, and what will it need to make the research more effective? What do you need to accomplish that goal? So I guess that, that I sort of asked you about um, cancer treatments and the goal. What about the personal goals you have for your lab in how it will have a role in and how it will grow? So thanks, I think it's uh, D, D. Braham, or thanks for that question. Um, so I've been very strategic, me and my group, about really building a strong infrastructure. So we have like 130 different model systems reflecting 130 different patients. And 30 and five of them are BRCA related, which is the highest, actually the biggest, the biggest uh, group in pancreatic cancer worldwide. So we worked really hard at building an infrastructure. So now we have like all the model systems in place, people are asked to collaborate with us and to get our systems. I've already explained how, how we do that. Um, and we've actually got, we would, we've actually got projects and model systems to have at least, an, at least a times two size lab. So I could easily have like 13, 14 lab members and I have enough projects to fill their time, you know, it's almost like doubling my activity. You know, the, I don't know if you know, but the infrastructure in Israel is much, is much more fragile or it's much poorer than the infrastructure abroad. I know because I have, you know, collaborations. Um, someone asked if I have a collaboration in Stanford Medical. So I'm sorry, I don't have there. Um, but I do have uh, at MD Anderson and I have in, at Toronto at OICR, at Princess Margaret, um, and we have at Penn University and uh, anyway, it doesn't matter in other places as well, but um, it would, it, 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 this, this, the medical system is just richer, you know, in the USA um, and Canada and the way that the government kind of gives money to the reach to the research system is also 
more coordinated and organized um, than here in Israel. So we really have to, you know, we really pushed. I can tell you one thing, and I, I know because I write grants with my colleagues abroad, the shekel or the dollar goes much further in my lab. What does that mean? We are used to using, uh, because we have less money, and like even though we have less money, we've still managed to build like the biggest um, the, the biggest model system, say with with pancreatic cancer and and, and uh, BRCA mutation, because we've really like pushed kind of our dollar as far as we could, and that I can tell you for certain that you know we really use we try to really use our money wisely because we have less money. Excellent. Um, just gonna we're gonna do one more question, and and as you said, you're answering some anyway, so. This is from someone anonymous, which is fine. Um, they asked three questions, but I'm gonna focus on the second one. For females that have BRCA2 mutations, would other medications such as birth control pills help fight against the potential development of cancer, i.e. breast cancer? So just briefly, I, I know personally through my own research that there is an impact of hormone-like drugs like birth control um, on and pregnancy and breastfeeding potentially on um, the risks of developing cancer, but um, just maybe just briefly comment on how other medications um, reduce or increase risk um, and what people need to know. So we know that um, ophorectomy, which means taking out your ovaries, reduces the risk of um, ovarian cancer and also reduces the risk of, of breast cancer. So um, one of the preventative methods is to do, you know, to take your ovaries out once you finish having children. And it's normally around the age of 38 to 42 in most women in the Western world. Um, in regard to preventative methods, um, they're still contradictional um, uh, questions on certain um, hormonal drugs or anti uh, birth controls are still, it's not 100% sure that that is the right thing to do. Um, and then there's also just the op option of having, you know, your breast, um, having a mastectomy and a reconstruction. We know that as well. And maybe we should just finish the questions here. Are these, sure. are there methods to take now that could prevent development of cancer for those that have bracket mutations? So we know that doing sports is really important. We know that that helps to facilitate the immune system and maybe prevent cancer, not, not specifically only for BRCA mutations, but also for all. Um, we know that, you know, we, we spoke about, I, I touched on that point that there are going to be people that are carriers but never develop cancer, who have a syndrome but never develop it. So there are environmental things and what we eat and how we live our lives and stress and, and sports. So that's an important thing. Um, and then uh, you can skip, it doesn't really, the, the fact of skipping a generation is what, that's question number three. It's not, uh, you could call it skipping a generation, but I mean, the, the, per, the family member can still have the BRCA mutation and never develop cancer. Um, right. And we didn't, we didn't really go into just because of time, how it's passed on. Um, but you can also not, you can have a parent that has a BRCA mutation and then not get it because you have a 50% chance if one parent does and one parent doesn't, but if I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, but we didn't really get into that. So that, that's something if people uh, want to know about, you know, obviously talk to your doctor about if you have a concern that there's been, and, and part of this talk as well as, and, and part of um, some of the activities I want to do are awareness about, you know, some people don't, aren't even today aren't aware of BRCA mutations in their family. And it's important if there is a history of cancer, and especially with the relatively low cost of getting um, genetic testing done, it's not always low cost, but relatively low. Um, you know, it, some of these things are important to know. Um, as I said, I personally made the decision at around 39 to have um, testing done and to deter, and it was determined I had a BRCA1 mutation. And that way I can make uh, decisions about that. Um, going forward and with, with that knowledge as opposed to just not knowing about it. So um, so thank you again, Dr. Golan. I'm just gonna turn it over quickly to uh, a nut to say some, to, to say a couple final words, but I am gonna again, just show the QR code for 10 seconds or so. If people 
um, want to buy the, the Helping Hand tote bag and see the Maryland Initiative site and get the information from it. Again, you could just scan your screen or go to the MarylandInitiative.org. And again, it was very important to me. This is 100% of the profits are going to Dr. Golan's lab. This is in no way um, a profitable, a for-profit venture. It's, it's all with the goal of raising money uh, for Dr. Golan's lab and helping with some of the research that she's talked about today. So, um, uh, and you get, like I said, the $25 uh, discount from the registration fee for signing up today. So back to, to a nut to just say a few closing words. And uh, again, Dr. Golan, I know your time is very valuable. You're, you, have, uh, you have a lot of patience, you have a lot of work, and we really appreciate you spending the time um, this morning to talk to us. I do have actually good news. I have four children and my eldest daughter got engaged on Thursday. So <laughs> I'm still battling with excitement. <laughs> good to hear some good news uh, with what yeah. is sometimes in the world. So mazel tov on that. That's fantastic. That. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I'm just like babbling inside. So sure, sure. We all, That's everybody amazing. wants to hear good news. That's fantastic. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Golan, for taking the time and spending with us. Uh, and a big mazel tov for engagement. That's always amazing. You look so young. It's hard to believe you are <laughs> not really like uh, grown ups. Um, so people uh, asked about the initiative, and I think we have it on the chat. So if you want to check the, the link as well. And thank you so much, Michael. Uh, it really touched my heart. And I know everybody was very excited to hear about your initiative and the fact that you are dedicating your time and effort to help uh, Dr. Golan's lab. Um, you are a dear friend to Canadian Friends of Sheba. I think we met the uh, first time on our first in-person event in <laughs> October. It was really fascinating. And um, I just want to mention to all of you, thank you for jo joining us this morning. Uh, we are planning our first in-person gala in Toronto. In Ju on June 1st, we are going to celebrate the uh, Abram Courts, the treaty between Israel and um, uh, Bahrain and Abu Dhabi and the whole uh, Gulf uh, area. And Sheba is pioneering in, this, in those bridges. And uh, you please check your emails in the future to see, save the date and what we are planning in the future. And uh, you are all welcome to send email to me or to Michael if you have any question. Um, and I guess I'll try to send it over to Dr. Golan if it's a specific, uh, needs some uh, specific attention. So uh, thank you so much to all of you. And for Michael again and Talia Golan for joining us. One more. Yeah, can I have one it. more sentence? Sure. Michael, sure. thank you so much once again to you and your family. You really took me by surprise with this initiative and I'm grateful to receive. It's a beautiful way of giving. And I just want to also thank um, that also I'm just seeing now Dennis and Sarah Braham, lots of love and thanks for your ongoing support. And dear Sylvia, who has been supporting my lab for so many years and is so much a part of all these model systems that I've discussed. So a big hug to the three of you and just so great to see the support. It's, I'm just grateful to all of you. Thank you. And, and we're grateful for your work. Um, it's, you know, and you have, unfortunately, BRCA positive, uh, BRCA mutation uh, patients more so than in other places because of the preponderance in the Jewish population. So it's, a, it's unfortunate, but it's an also an opportunity maybe for you to uh, help treat these, this, this terrible disease uh, in the future and and for good to come from it so thanks again and thanks to everybody who attended uh there will be a web uh, a recording available um for people who want to share with others who couldn't be here today and uh thank you again and, and enjoy the rest of your sunday <laughs>